get my script right. Good evening. It's uh, Thursday, January 21st. It's 532. This is a meeting of the Northampton Board of Health. We have all our members present and this is a Zoom meeting and is, it is being recorded. Uh, do we have anyone here for public comment? Not that I see. Um, no, I don't see anyone for public comment unless Greta wanted to comment. And if that's the case, Greta, raise your hand. Okay. Okay, so then uh, we'll move on. I don't think we had any minutes. Do we have any minutes? No. Okay. Um, Okay, so we're going to have a relatively brief meeting tonight because everybody's busy. Um, Meredith, you want to give us, tell us where we're at with uh, vaccinations? Do you, uh, yeah, let me just kind of go through. I'll give you where we're at in Northampton right now, and then we'll get to vaccinations just so okay. I can update you on that. Actually, I'll do, um, the weekly report just came out, so I can give you a little more data than that too. Um, in the states right now, we're at 462,910 total cases, and we have about 89,000 active cases to date, and we've had 13,622 fatalities, unfortunately. The seven-day positivity rate with higher education right now is 5.57, and without... That's, that's the state or that's local? That's the state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and without higher education, it's 7.1. Um, because of frequent testing at higher education, it kind of waters down the actual uh, true percent positivity rate. But what I'd like to note here is that um, on January 8th, I have in my notes that the positivity rate for the state with higher education was H, and I think that was our peak. And um, without higher education, it was almost 9.2. So it's come down significantly, not sure. I'm not saying it's a trend. I'm just noting that for right now and hopefully we're in the right direction. Um, in Northampton, we're currently at 879 cases total to date. Um, our positivity rate this week is 2.70. That's down from last week, which was 3.36. So I like seeing that also. Our daily average incident rate is 7.07, .07, and our incident rate per 100,000 is 24.19. So Meredith, our, our, sorry, um, our numbers include uh, Smith yes. College testing. The state does not break down with and without higher education on a county or a community level. They've never done that, and it would, we don't have the capacity to do it. So we would never be able to provide those numbers. So out of our 879 cases in January, since January 1st, we've had 170 cases. In December, we had 201. In November, we had 106. October 28. And then September, we had two cases. In August, we didn't have any cases. So you can see how those numbers have spiked over the, um, the winter season, the late fall and winter season. Hospital capacity, the state's um, occupied inpatient beds were at 85%. Occupied ICU beds were at 78%. In Western Mass, we're at 84% occupied inpatient and 62% in ICU. So we're doing a little, uh, no, a little worse than the state average here in Western Massachusetts. Um, Locally, we're very busy. Census is pretty high in all the hospitals that I keep track on. Joanne, do you want to kind of give us an overview of what you're seeing at Cooley Dickinson Hospital? Yeah, it's been variable. We had a couple of weeks ago when we sort of were at our peak, we had a very high general census. Um, <clears throat> and, a, you know, a few days where administrators were working on the floors and everybody was all hands on deck. Uh, but for the most part, the hospital has been busy, but not overwhelmed. We, our ICU is busy. Um, in the spring, our maximum number of COVID patients at any one time was 20. We did surpass that um, at the end of last year. The highest was 21, and now we're hovering usually like 15, 17, somewhere around there. Um, so it does appear that, you know, in the last week or two, it does appear to be trending down just a touch. A slight, yeah, a slight bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
That's good. Um, we do have, um, you know, some very large complex clusters happening right now that we're trying to identify all the close contacts with. Um, it's very, very discouraging that we're 10, 11 months into this pandemic and people are still congregating at large social gatherings and going about their daily business as if the pandemic is, is not here. Um, it brings you, me to my knees. Can you clarify a little bit about the situations of those without de detail, identifying details, but, but what kind, are they businesses? Are they home gatherings? Are they weddings? Are they, you know? Right, right. So primarily what we're seeing now are um, gatherings and home settings with with members outside of your household family. So those, it might be a family gathering, but they're all from different households getting together. That is very, very common. Um, we, you know, the, the GPH puts out every single week kind of what's trending in terms of clusters. And I don't have that in front of me, but um, that I think accounts for 70% of all of the clusters is the, the social gatherings. We Would do, that be categorized as family gatherings? There's a category in there for, I think, I, household or family household. Gathering? Household. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would that be fall into that, or is there another yep. category? Nope, that falls into that. Then we have social gatherings. That's also in the top seven um, for most clusters, large clusters. Um, and I can't remember how many there are, but those are gatherings outside of, of the household. We see a lot in Northampton of workplace exposures and transmission happening in our workplace, especially in um, you know our restaurants that have really smaller you know kitchens, workspaces. It's really hard if you have someone who is pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic to stop that spread. What we have done for our businesses, especially our restaurants is we've been offering testing to them once a week at the senior center. And that's been helping so much to identify if someone is positive, you know, sooner rather than later before we actually have transmission. So that's a tool that we're able to provide to them. And we've been doing that since probably the beginning of December, huh, Kel? We're probably on our sixth or seventh week or something like that. Um, I didn't know you were still doing that. Oh yeah, we offer testing twice a week, once on Mondays at the senior center, and then we test all of our um, staff and faculty at all of our schools. So seven schools, we go every Friday, the vendor goes to each and every school, which has been really, really <laughs> helpful. And the teachers totally appreciate that. So that's, that's awesome. been ongoing. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So originally you thought you only had funding till the end of December, you got more funding? <laughs> So the CARES Act has been, was supposed to be done on the 31st of December, but it's been extended a whole nother year. So now it's until December 31st, 2021. So we're allowed to use that CARES Act money. And I do believe FEMA does pay for 75% on um, for testing. So there is money out there. Mm -hmm. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have been in um, hybrid at the schools and all was going very well. And I sit on a, an advisory committee to the superintendent and once a week we get together, I think there's about five or six of us to discuss you know, uh, a recommendation to the superintendent on should we pause or should we just move forward and continue with this hybrid um, model. And, um, you know, it's difficult, but one of the things that we look at closely, obviously we're looking at percent positivity rates in our community. We're looking at case counts in our community, but more especially we're looking, to, we're looking at cases within the schools and if there's any transmission happening in the schools. That's my number one metric, right? And we haven't had that. We've had cases in the school intermittently here and there, but we've been able to contain them and we haven't had any spread. There was only one case in all of this time where there was actually transmission and it was on a bus, okay? We have not had any transmission in the school. So I've been very confident saying to the superintendent and to this advisory committee, I'm comfortable continuing with the, the hybrid model. 
Well, they were on break for winter. We decided prior to break that we knew probably behaviors weren't going to be stellar and there was going to be household gatherings, you know, probably outside of your immediate household for the holidays. So why don't we just kind of take a pause and let things air out for at least 14 days after Christmas, right? Because that's the incubation period. So if there are any events to happen, we had this break. So anyways, during this pause time, we saw cases increase tremendously, you know, from like right before Christmas till, you know, like 10, 11 days after Christmas. So when I was sitting in that advisory group and we're getting ready to go back to school, my resources in the health department are so severely tapped. I mean, the two nurses and myself are pulling over 14 hour days, we're exhausted. Um, we're now starting to roll out vaccination clinics to help support the state efforts. I said to the superintendent and to the committee a couple weeks ago, I said, I don't have the support that you need to continue. I said, we can't help with contact tracing at the rate that we were doing. It was very time consuming. And so I advocated a bunch of public health strategies that they should be thinking about in order for me to be comfortable to say, go ahead back to remote learning. And one of them was having their own contact tracer, right? That just does the schools and the school community. I'd been advocating for that since September, but it never happened. But now that I'm saying we're tapped, we're not diminished, we're just, we can't do any more. Um, the superintendent agreed to hire a contact tracer that'll be supervised hired by the school, but will be supervised both by my team and the school team. So that's fantastic. So we're onboarding that person right now. I also, you know, there are other strategies that I talked about that are really important as we move forward, if we're going to go back into the hybrid um, mode, is reiterate messaging to caregivers about their role if their children want to be back into school, right? We're still seeing, and actually I'm trying to contain one right now, clusters with school-aged children getting together and doing social activities, doing um, close contact sports. These, these clusters have legs and affect so many, so many families. And it's not only the children that are at, you know, um, doing these activities, they have younger children that go to different schools. So it's very hard. We need these parents to listen. If they want school to open back up, you got to do your part. You got to help us. You got to keep everybody at home. We got to get through this, you know, this second surge. Also, we're encouraging, you know, or reiterating, you know, if your kid is sick or if you have a household member who um, has been, you know, a confirmed positive or has to, you know, have known contact with a positive, please call your school nurse. You know, it's another message that we want to get back home. Um, back to the back to the families. I just feel like there's so much work that needs to be done before I comfortably say, let's open back up. So the superintendent, I think, really heard this message. I don't know if it was last week or the week before, and he's been working really hard. He's been, you know, sending home letters and doing robocalls to to families and caregivers, saying it it takes. It takes a village, right? That's not his word, you know, his quote, but it takes a village. It takes all of us to be doing this together in order to move forward. Um, I thought it was, I thought it would have worked. I thought it would have helped, but yet again, I'm now investigating a very large cluster that has to do with a lot of children and a lot of activities. And I feel like the message just went by the wayside. But I feel like that with the general public and all, a lot of my messaging, I feel just is background noise now. Nobody's really listening. Everybody's tired. And we need the community to come together and work together. I think we're very fortunate in respect when I look at other communities, you know, percent positivity rates and rates per, per 100,000 in Northampton, we're doing fairly good. Like we're doing better than most communities in Hampshire County, Western Mass. I mean, overall, when I, comparatively speaking, we're doing really good, but there's a lot more room for us to be doing a lot better. So anyways, that was a long story about, I don't even know where it started. <laughs> um, things are just extremely busy. 
And then now we're going to add to it that Smith students are returning into actually they're phasing in starting tomorrow. I think I don't remember if it's 700 or 1300 students that are going to be coming back to Smith College starting tomorrow. And I think it's like every third or fourth day they're phasing in more and more students. They're going to have mandatory quarantine, mandatory testing upon arrival. All students are going to have to test three times a week, at least until the end of February. Um, so I still worry having an extra 1300 bodies in Northampton, what that's going mm -hmm. to mean for us, what are the effects going to mean for us. I have um, written to um, Carrie Beth Garvey, who I think she is the director of health services at Smith, um, really, you know, asking strongly, encouraging that their lead contact tracer get on on Maven because a lot if they're not, it, we're not going to be efficient. There's going to be duplicative work on both sides. Um, you know, th there's just so many reasons why I need them to be on Maven. Um, with 1,300 students coming to campus. So we're in the process of having conversations about that, but yeah, that returning of 1,300 students certainly gives me pause. Have they, um, um, have you asked them, I'm sorry, I just missed your last sentence, but have you asked them if they would uh, require students to stay on campus the way Amherst did? What do you mean? Well, in Amherst College, they told their students they could not leave campus. They told them, you know, you can go to this street, to the street, to the street, and you may not go into town. Um, and I don't know why, and that worked really well, and they also had testing, but I don't know why Smith College couldn't do that. Interesting. Okay. I took note of that. I'll ask. Great. So, um, so the other big project that we have going on is the vaccination clinics that we're running. Last week we started, we stood up clinics to um, support the state's efforts and getting all of our first responders vaccinated. Um, we opened it up to Hampshire County, uh, Amherst and Northampton decided to split the county. They'll take the upper, we'll take the lower river. We did 13 or 14 communities um, of their first responders. We ended up doing 590 vac vaccinations, 95% uh, of them were first responders. When we realized we had extra vaccine and extra appointments, we opened it up to our shelter residents, our congregate shelter residents, and a few healthcare workers, which was great to fill those spots. We have been very, very adamant that we are not going out of line of those bullets in phase one. It is very scripted and I don't wanna be accused of doing anything that I'm not supposed to be doing. So it says phase one and it has bullet one, two, three, and four. We were on up to bullet three. That's where we stopped. With the exception, I don't want vaccines sitting in my fridge and not being in arms, you know? So if we're done with phase three, bullet three and phase one, we would go down to the fourth bullet, but that's it. Um, so our first week went really well. Our, we held six clinics, five days. Each clinic is four hours long. Our throughput was 30 people per hour. So it was 120 a day. It was a little slow. We decided that we could double that. And that's what we're gonna do moving forward starting next week. Um, I've also heard from uh, the State COVID Command Center that they're gonna make an announcement soon that they're actually going to flatten uh, uh, flatten phase one. So anyone who falls under phase one is going to be eligible now. You don't have to follow these bulleted items, um, priority groups, which is fantastic because it was very, very difficult and time consuming for us to vet if you actually fell under this, this priority group. So that's fantastic. Um, so we're gonna continue um, vaccinating those who fall under phase one, and these are closed, they're not open to the public, so it's almost by invitation only. I send you a link, you sign up, you show your ID and your employment verification, you, and then you get your vaccine. Um, when we get to phase two, we will be on the state map and it's gonna be um, open to the public. For those who fall under phase two, you have to register, you have to attest, that you fall under phase two. And again, you will have to provide some type of verification um, that you fall under phase two. 
And we're going to be putting this information. Andy Lesko from the mayor's office is going to design a web page for us all about vaccinations and eligibility and how to register, which is great, which will be extremely helpful because we get calls by the hundreds, calls and emails by the hundreds. When am I going to get my vaccine? Am I eligible? Where can I go? Mad at us that we can't give it to them. Um, it hasn't made us very popular yet again. <laughs> um, so we're gonna have that webpage hopefully done sooner than later with all of that information. So next week we do have clinics set up. I think we have three days worth of clinics where we're going to, they're gonna again be four hour clinics. We're gonna double our throughput to 240 per four hour period. So with just those three days, four hour clinics, we should be able to get about uh, 1200, uh, excuse me, 1200, 1200 people done a week. We'll have the capacity to do more, but I just kind of want to slowly open it up so we can work our kinks out. Um, now, caveat being is if we get our vaccine. The state is not sitting on any vaccine. They are not holding vaccine. They are getting their shipments weekly. We put in a request on Mondays for what we think we are going to vax the following week, okay? The, Request goes in on Mondays, they review all of them on Wednesdays, and they hopefully ship out that Friday or Monday, okay? If they don't ship out, obviously you can't hold your clinics. So we put in all the language out there, you know, this is, these clinics are pending on if we get our vaccine shipments. What could hold it up on the federal level? I have no idea, but it's week to week right now. Soon, I mean, I'm thinking within the next month, it'll be a little more fluid and there'll be more vaccine to go around. But right now, this is the way it is. Do you guys have any questions for me? I can't hear you, Joanne. You're no, muted. Sorry. You don't hold back the second dose, right? No, hold back the second dose. What do you mean? You don't reserve their second dose. You just wait till you get more from the state. Mm -hmm. So we're using the state's new software system that got rolled out um, last week. It's called PrepMod. And when it's working properly, it's going to be fantastic because all the registration is done in PrepMod and PrepMod speaks to MIIS and speaks to the Vaccine Distribution Center and it speaks to the Commonwealth third party um, billing company. So everything is done in there. So when prep mod, the vaccine unit set sees that we've used X amount of doses, they'll realize that and we'll be able to ship us some more. So it's, it's the platform is amazing. Mm -hmm. It's had a few kinks that we've had to work out and I'm sure there's could be a few more, but the capacity has, it has is wonderful. But no, we're, we don't have the second doses for those that have already gotten their first. That'll come when we put in our order for that upcoming week. And it's strongly encouraged that you get your second dose where you got your first dose. Um, Meredith, I would like to pass on a bit of, of the experience for our office, which is not Northampton. And I have to preface this by saying, I, I get that everybody has been working flat out for a year and everyone's exhausted. Um, if you were a provider uh, under the first bullet, but you were not affiliated mm -hmm. with a large institution, you were out in the cold. We were completely overlooked. We were told by the state that we were supposed to go to the hospitals or the community health centers, that they were responsible for distributing vaccine to us. And those institutions said, once they vaccinated their folks, that was it. So people who, people who were due to get vaccine first, um, the only way you've been able to get a vaccine is through word of mouth. And I was interested to hear what Joanne said at the beginning because that's sort of vaccine delivery for those who are not affiliated. Mm -hmm. And if, if someone, if someone hadn't called me 
to ask Chris about volunteering to vaccine, to give vaccine and a whole series of crazy whisper down the lane phone calls, yeah. we would not have been able to get vaccine. And we only got it because we, had an, we were able to find an insider at the uh, first responder vaccine site in Greenfield. There, there are a lot of, I, I know everyone's upset, but these are healthcare providers. I totally agree. And we actually identified this gap early on because when we had extra vaccine last week at our clinics and we were going down the bullets, we didn't know who the hell these people were and how to get in touch right. with them. So we identified this problem very early on and this weekend, I, I, I sent out emails to the top of the agencies, to, you know, the VNAs and MASH, you know, all the uh, group homes with substance use disorder people um, and to um, hospice care. I went right to the top and I said, hey, we're out here in Hampshire County. We've stood up a clinic. I don't know how to reach your people that are not affiliated with any hospitals, but we want to get vaccines in their arms. I said, can you help me spread the word? And they were like, holy cow, can we? Yes. You know, they were thrilled because true gap. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well, this just once again proves we do not have a healthcare system uh, in all seriousness, because um, there are a whole lot of people that have no affiliation with the groups that you mentioned. And, and, I, and I appreciate that you're trying to reach as many people as possible, but this has been a very difficult situation for a lot of people mm -hmm. beyond, beyond the obvious um, exhaustion and everything you've been trying to do. Uh, so I just wanted to, to point that out. It's been, I, I can't tell you the, the hours and the days and the frustration uh, of just trying to find out how somebody who's not mm -hmm. on staff somewhere, um, but is delivering healthcare can, We've can, been on the recipient end of hundreds of those calls. I know, yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I, and I don't want to, I don't want to beat this to death, but it's, it, it almost brings me to tears to think about what we've had to go through for this, but I got shot number one. So there you have it. But a second part of this is I do know people who have contacted me who said they either would love to be volunteer vaccinators or would love to set up their own clinic. I, I, someone talked to me today, an individual um, physician who said I could give 300 on a weekend mm -hmm. and, and my staff would do it. And I keep trying to find out or get information or get somebody to answer that's able to help um, me understand how to go about doing that. Mm -hmm. So those who want to volunteer at a clinic should contact Lauren Davin and Kelly's going to put up in the chat box um, her email address. Okay. 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 Because we need volunteers. We're thinking we are going to be doing clinics, you know, four days, five days a week for the next four, six months, if not longer. So we're going to need a lot of volunteers. Okay. But they need to be vaccinated first. They get their vaccine the day they volunteer. We, right. we, don't, we don't vaccinate prior to any volunteer. Mm -hmm. Got it. I understood. But that, that's obviously part of the part of the program. Yeah. yeah. And that's allowable by the state. Um, and what was the second part of the question? I need to uh, individual providers who would oh, like to Oh, so they can, they, you have to enroll through MBC. CP, I can send you that link. I don't remember what it is offhand. You have to put in a proposal to enroll to become a vaccinating site. Yeah. And there's certain criteria that has to be met. Yeah. And they'll decide they'll either approve you or not approve you. Um, I, 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 I think the person that was speaking to me had actually done that, but hadn't heard anything. And I, I understand people are, as I said, working flat out. Um, is it still a requirement that you have to be in the medical reserve corps to be no. a vaccine? Okay. No. Mm -hmm. uh, I also heard from somebody you have to have a quarry to, to give vaccine. To give vaccine or to yeah. see support staff? To, to give vaccine. So we, oh, yeah, I don't. So we do vet our MRC volunteers. So right. Have all of their licenses and we do a quarry check on them. Right, but but 
uh, you can't get a Corey right now. We can. We have a. We. You can. Mm -hmm. And the MRC can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's great because I know somebody at the state who told me they're not doing Corys right now. So we so, are locally. Good. Chief that's Pasper great. is helping us out because she knows the volunteers. So why why you need to have a Corey to 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 get a vaccine is beyond me, but I'm not going to. It's question. just been the standard protocol since. Got it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to look at policy a, change on that right now. Yeah, just another yeah. barrier. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that information. I um, this is a sore subject for me, and I and you're the wrong people to even be um, talking to about it because you you folks have nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wish you would have come to me earlier, though, so I could have helped, you know, kind of work out, you know, what was happening. I, I feel like I could have helped you a bit. Well, thanks. Uh, we were in a different county. We we're trying to do it not just for myself, but mm -hmm. for uh, others involved. I, and I wanted everybody to be able to get it at the same time. Mm -hmm. But yeah. thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for that offer. Mm -hmm. So if you know people who are frustrated because there are other groups who of healthcare workers who haven't gotten their vaccine yet starting next week it's going to be open for all healthcare workers you know unaffiliated healthcare workers so it's just and, you know, happened and a little the, later and the UMass site has been very helpful because they have a lot of slots mm -hmm. and that 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 is it, something just of the past couple of days that has relieved that's where i've been sending people mm -hmm. Is to, I, 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 yeah, they have a lot, a lot of openings. They're sitting yeah. idle. But again, it's because they're following the bullets. You know, as soon as that's lifted, I think we'll see a lot more people through our doors. That That's great. I'm looking forward to that. Because it's, that, a, it's an awful shame having vaccine in your fridge when it should be going into arms. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's a tragedy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. But just wait till you open it to 65 and older, you'll be swamped. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can't wait. <laughs> Joanne, you're muted. Yeah. Is there anything other than COVID or COVID vaccine in the world to talk about right now? <laughs> I don't think so. I've got to put my 2000, my fiscal 22 budget together in the next week. <laughs> <laughs> I have not done anything non-COVID for um, about 11 months now. I, yep. I need either. to restructure my um, cent center for prevention and make like a deputy director who's supervising them. They're doing the work now. They're not getting paid for it. They don't have the title. I, Cause I mean, this is gonna occupy at least another year of my life. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be looking to restructure with the support of the mayor before he goes because he knows all of the good work that we're doing over there. Um, but yeah. We're beat. Any questions, comments? Oh, good, Kel, you put the email up, great, thank you. Anything else, Meredith? Uh, not that I can think of. And I'm just checking, um, Laurent and I worked on the uh, revision to the uh, board member description. So I sent that along. It's, it's fine if we're not discussing it, but is that, can that be on the agenda at some point? Yeah, let's put it on the next agenda. You sent it where and when? I sent it to Meredith and to you, Joanne. Oh, when? <laughs> I call my email Recently? a dumpster fire, so I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, no worries, no worries. I just want want to let you know that we worked on it and did okay. it. And uh, I okay. would say two weeks ago. Oh, I did not see it. I'm sorry. No worries. Um, but okay. let's let's put it on the agenda for next time. Definitely. And if you if you need another copy of the draft, just let me know. Could you resend it and CC Kelly on it? So I, just, I got it. You got I it. Thought, okay. Yeah, I thought I did, but okay. Yeah. Good. Just Thanks, to clarify. Kelly. Just to clarify, Meredith, that email address is for people who want to set up a clinic. 
for people who are looking volunteer, for to volunteer. Volunteer. Thank you very much. It's been a long day. Thanks. All right. Uh, any other business? Anything else? Well, thank you all. Thank you, Meredith. You're amazing. And I went over to the senior center and it was the, the smoothest operation. Everyone was cool, calm, and collected and going really well. Two of your peeps from CDH did a tour early today too. Mm -hmm. And, yep, I can't remember their names. And yeah. you're all welcome if you want to come do a tour, let me know. Um, you can walk through it. And if you want to volunteer, there's plenty of opportunities for that too. Yeah, you have a nice big space there. We don't actually have that much space. We have, you know, conference rooms that are not that big and mm -hmm. you've got these nice separate spaces that you can use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, great job. I, I'm hoping, you know, when the weather is a little nicer, maybe March, start thinking about a drive through because we have a lot of elderly who are just not comfortable coming inside buildings and with other people. I don't think um, you can do a drive through with, with the observation. Uh, we'll have issue. to figure it out because there's a lot of people that are not going to come, Joanne, that I've talked to firsthand. They're not going to come inside and sit in a room with five other people and they're in that pod. They're just not going to do it. Because of COVID? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But they really, I, I was on a call the other day, someone asked about drive through and they said, you really cannot do observation in a car because some people could get out of the car and say, hey, I don't feel well. And other people are just gonna slump over. Um, and so you yeah. really can't do the observation in a car. They could sit outside their car mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and not be in that room, not be indoors, but right. they can't be in the car where you can't see them. Yep, yeah. and yeah. maybe that's what we do. Yeah, mm -hmm. bring your own lawn chair. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> <laughs> heated tents they have those large heated tents i'm not sure but i do know we have to start thinking about it mm -hmm. and, and there's we, this oh sorry go ahead no you go ahead uh, just um, i'm sure this is taken care of but I'll, I'll bring it up anyway um the winter market is going to start at the senior center saturday mm -hmm. really so yeah. is there a cleaning procedure mm -hmm. Yeah, Before they can, and after? Yes, there is. Okay, so okay. It's, there's three Saturdays, one in January, one in February, okay. one in March. And the we're not doing anything tomorrow specifically so they can come in and fog the senior Great. center. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Anything else? Would anyone like to uh, make a uh, proposal? I'd like to give Meredith a drink and tell you to, but <laughs> I will move to adjourn the meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Yep. Yep. Do a roll call. Lauren? Yes. Uh, Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. All right, thank you all. And thank uh, you all. Do we have an oh, do we have our next date? Uh yes, February 18. 18. Yes, that sounds about right. Is that okay with everyone? And then I'm thinking, you know, after our after February come March, we can have more normal meetings. Um, I'm sorry that this is abbreviated. It was just a quick update on on COVID. But okay. one more month, I'm thinking. I and understand you have other things to do. <laughs> Meredith, yep. uh, the, the type of volunteers that Lauren is, uh, Lauren is looking for, it's any type? So, I, I mean, so nope, we're looking for nurses. Yes. We're also looking for um, people to support just, you know, no one who doesn't have a medical background. We need those people too to help support the the operations because we have greeters outside, we have greeters inside, we have people on registration tables. So there's a variety of roles that need to be done that you don't need any type of medical background in. Um, but we also in each of one of each of our vaccination rooms, we have a medic who's doing the vaccine, and then we want a support medical person to help with the data input through this prep mod that we're using and then help with observation because people have to sit for a minimum of 15 minutes. So we want two eyes in each room. The way that we have it set up, Lauren, is right now we have um, 
every 20 minutes, we have 10 people coming through, two pods of five. Those pods come in together. Those pods go into their room together. Those pods leave together. Next week, when we double down on our capacity, we're going to have four pods of five. So 20 people every 20 minutes doing the same thing. So that second set of eyes, the medic is still going to do the administration just for fidelity reasons right now and the training that we've provided them and Sarah Burgess. I'm comfortable with them doing the actual administration, but the um, the nurses can that will be in the same room can help with vaccine drawing and also observation. So we need both. And right now it's just during the week, right? It's not on weekends. Nope, we're gonna hold one. My plan is, so next week it's Wednesday morning, Thursday evening and Saturday nine to one. So we know people work. Um, so we're trying to accommodate the best we can without burning ourselves out. Mm -hmm. How do you know when phase one is done? The state will tell us. Oh. Yeah, I mean, they, right now they have this general guideline that says phase one is between now and the first week of February, then phase two will start. Again, it's, it's, um, it's not set in stone, cast in stone, but it's their intent to open up phase two. What is it, Joanne, the first week? After the first, I thought the I first of February, February, I think. First but, the, February. Um, but anybody who's in an earlier category who didn't show up can always yep. come. Yes. Yeah. And phase two is generally for which one? 75 and over. Okay. 65. What? Phase two? Did they change it? They changed it, was, it again? 65? It was 75. Was it was it? 75, but then the CDC changed it to 65, but the state hadn't updated right. it. So I don't know where the state is they right now. They update it every Tuesday and Thursday. Hold on, I have it right here. Hold on one second. Some states like Florida just did it overnight, uh, whether or not there was guidance and that, that didn't work out well. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see, phase two. Nope, oh, I'm sorry, it is still 75 plus. Okay. Oh, then at the bottom of phase two is adult 65. Plus. Adult 65, yeah. So it depends if they open up all of phase two or if they just do it graduated the way they did with phase one. Right, right, right. So exactly. So 65 and older in that phase, but they're the third bullet down. Okay. All righty. Good to see you all. Stay well. Thank Stay you. healthy. Thank you. And keep you checking that too. website. <laughs> all right. And, and contact me if you guys want to volunteer, if you want a tour. Thank you. If you volunteer, you get vaccine. Mm -hmm. Remember that. Mm -hmm. Really? Really? Yep, you do. Th thank, thank Merida for everything. You're welcome. That, thank you guys. That you continue to do. It's amazing work. All right. Thank you all. Yes, bye -bye. You. you too, Kelly. Bye -bye. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. It keeps me standing, Suzanne. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. I'm just exhausted <laughs> hearing the report. <laughs> Definitely. All right. Bye, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.